This is Thought in Motion, a series dedicated to the seminars of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Today's video is part two of our introductory exploration of Seminar 5. While a common broad aim in most forms of psychotherapy is to increase happiness, psychoanalysis confronts us with how and why happiness may not be attainable. It acknowledges the inherent tragedy in the human condition and helps us situate our activities in light of this fact. These two approaches are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Perhaps you can work on improving the quality of your life while also facing this reality. The challenge is that therapy often focuses on strengthening the ego, which can numb us to the tragic dimension of ourselves that psychoanalysis points toward. Ignoring it means also likely ignoring those pervasive contradictions within our personal, political, and religious identities that underlies our discontents like the self-proclaimed social progressive displaying blatant racism, the religious leader who preaches peace but who is violent to those they have power over, the superstitious atheist, or the loving parent who abuses their child. These contradictions follow us everywhere. I say all this by way of an introduction to a more comprehensive examination of the graph of desire in today's video. The graph portrays desire's origins, movements, transformations, and failures. Having done an initial exploration of this graph when considering the distinctions between need, demand, and desire in the previous video, we can now return to this graph from a wider lens. While I try to keep most of my interpretations within the bounds of what Lacan says in Seminar 5, at points I take some liberties to supplement this with his later statements, some secondary sources on this matter, and offer some of my own elaborations. Inevitably, there will be important details passed over, but we'll have the chance to cover them in greater depth once we turn to the individual lectures of this seminar. We'll also be able to put to test any of the claims and interpretations I make here to see how well they hold up. This video turned out to be much longer than usual. I thought about breaking it up into multiple videos, but there ended up being a kind of coherence that I wouldn't want to lose. I've added chapter timestamps, which you can find in the description should you want to jump to a particular part. We begin with the symbol delta, representing a mythological pre-symbolic subject of need that we never reach in actuality. Think of it as the Garden of Eden before the fall, the state of nature before society imposes its chains, a la Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Or Freud's notion of an oceanic feeling of oneness that we imagine to be the experience of infants. Although these situations are portrayed as if they were some kind of distant memory, the original state itself is actually a retroactive construction in light of our current brokenness. As such, we are forever longing for something impossible to return to, condemned to a nostalgia for what we have never been. This mythological subject of need undergoes symbolic structuring and having always already passed through the chain of signifiers. Signifiers are characterized by their capacity for movement and exchange. First signifiers operate through metonymy, wherein signifiers become contingently linked together with each other through the subject's history and the sequence of utterances. For example, the word I and am in a sentence like I am hungry or I am angry are metonymically linked. However, this connection is fragile and signifiers can be dropped and replaced at any time. Second, signifiers operate through metaphorical substitutions and condensations. This process leads to the creation of new meanings or the enrichment and modification of old meanings. Metaphorical substitutions rely on shifting metonymic relations. So for instance, I am hangry is a substitution where hangry comes to replace the signifiers hungry and angry. This produces a new meaning that then gets attached to this signifier. Yet arriving there required separating the H from hungry and combining it with angry. 
Witticisms are like this hangry example, and it's why Lacan spends a good amount of time in the first part of Seminar 5 examining Freud's texts, jokes, and their relation to the unconscious. How is it that meaning emerges simply by the conjoining of signifiers in this manner? Here we can think back to Lacan's example of the highway in Seminar 3. A central signifier, that being the highway, anchors other signifiers in a particular order, that being the roads leading away from and toward the highway. Now we can imagine at the major intersections of these roads emerges a shopping center, representing a center of meaning. The roads were not created to get to the shopping center, but rather the shopping center was built because of the placement of the roads, providing the opportunity for many potential customers to drive by. There may have been some original impetus for the highway being created in the first place, some need we might say, but that original motivating source has long receded into the background and now the meaning of these roads is retroactively changed so as to seem as though they were built strictly for the purpose of getting to the shopping center. The subject emerges out of this function of the signifier that it acquires its subjectivity in a certain sense to the degree that one signifier, the name of the father, comes to be substituted for another signifier, the desire of the mother, giving rise to what is called the paternal metaphor. At the same time, there remains a surplus that fails to be captured here, and it will be for this reason the subject is constituted as a split subject, which we see at the terminal point of graph 1. Turning to graph 2, we can see that the terminal point of graph 1 now becomes the starting point, with that mythological pre-symbolic subject of need being reconstituted as a subject that is fundamentally divided. This gap marks the subject as enigmatic to itself. And I believe the symbol for the split subject can also be considered to represent what Freud calls the id, the S in German, something that Lacan seemingly makes explicit in Seminar 2. In Seminar 5, Lacan states that the id is the realization of the first need which has no chance of ever being known, because it is entirely caught up in the dialectic of language, while at the same time lies beyond desires captured in language. The id is not the subject of the statement, which is the subject I identify myself as, the ego, but it is instead an uncomprehended signifier that lives in me and that speaks through me, addressing itself to the big other. This path marks the relationship between the split subject and the big other, which we addressed in the last video. The big other is a function fulfilled by the symbolic mother and symbolic father, but in different ways. The symbolic mother is the first big other in the child's life, allowing for entrance into language. It will be the mother's absence that ultimately renders her a signifier, marking the traumatic kernel of the subject's existence. This absence can be literal, but more centrally, it is the failures to satisfy the child's demands for unconditional love that will be the hallmark of this absence. Important to mention here is that the roles of the real mother and the real father are a material support for these symbolic functions, just as the signifying chain is supported by the materiality of the signifier and speech is supported by the materiality of the voice. It's at this point, and I imagine also this point for many of you, that I can tend to feel ambivalent toward the use of real family roles to identify what are essentially symbolic functions. Consequently, it, this opens it up to all sorts of misunderstandings. But this reaction is not entirely surprising within the theory once we see how the line between the subject and the big other is first conjoined at another intersecting point wherein we find the imaginary relation. The imaginary relation consists of the little other and its mirroring counterpart, the ego. As briefly indicated in the previous video, these terms are at times flipped, and it would seem that Lacan did that intentionally to illustrate the transitivity that marks the relation. The little other stands in for the ideal ego, which serves as the source of the subject's first identifications. At the same time, 
It's an object of desire that through the mechanism of projection presents the promise of wholeness or completeness. The subject comes to identify themselves with this image, even though it ultimately is an alienated misrecognition. Despite this, the imaginary relation is a critical one because it provides the subject with a foundation and point of support in mapping out its relationship to reality. It affords the subject an initial sense of mastery by which to situate and distinguish itself from the real. At the same time, it is a fundamentally narcissistic and fragile relationship when considered on its own terms. Returning to the signifying chain, we have what can now be called the line of prohibition. This line passes through the message and the big other. There are two implications of this. First, there are only some aspects of the message that are allowed to be formulated in concrete discourse. Since the message is a source of satisfaction for the subject in giving a meaning to its demand, prohibitions prevent any kind of complete satisfaction. Second, in passing through the big other, the treasure trove of signifiers and the place wherein the symbolic mother is first situated, we find that there is something fundamentally prohibited in the mother herself, which entails an encounter with privation, wherein the big other comes to be found as lacking and thus a desiring subject like oneself. I should mention here that the way I drew out the relation between the symbolic mother and symbolic father in the last video I think was a bit misleading since I placed the symbolic father above in the location corresponding to the location where the symbolic mother is in relation to the subject. However, this fails to recognize the function of the symbolic father in the line crossing through the location of the big other down here. For me at least, it's helpful to think of this prohibition in terms of language rather than people, as I believe Lacan would encourage us to do, whereby we can come to see that this prohibition is one in which some signifiers are not allowed to pass on to the subject, and most notably the signifier representing the mother's desire. And there will be a point at which the child will try to fill this void by seeking out and identifying with various imaginary objects. And here is where enters the imaginary phallus. But it's all in a futile attempt to fill this lack by oneself in trying to become the thing that the child imagines the mother desires. The line of prohibition has the label signifier and voice at its two ends. I believe this signifier is what Lacan refers to as the name of the father, which cuts through the mother situated here, marking her with a lack that will render it impossible to become an ever-present source of love that the child demands. But what about the voice? If this line is to represent the father's speech, then the voice is perhaps where the prohibition most notably manifests in the form of a repressing agency. As such, we find located here a dimension of the superego. The superego's association with the voice becomes important, especially when we consider psychosis, wherein the foreignness of this voice arrives not from within the subject, but outside it in the real. Now, notably, Lacan mentions that there are two expressions of the superego, a paternal superego and a maternal superego, the latter being what Lacan calls much more demanding, more oppressive, more devastating, and more insistent. If the paternal superego is located here on the line of prohibition, where then is the maternal superego located? I have some thoughts about this that we'll be returning to in a little bit. So having talked about the superego, we can now ask about the ego ideal and what function it plays. The ego ideal is located at the place where the split subject was originally on graph 1. It anchors the subject, offering a point of stabilization and supervision over the flow of imaginary identifications that are ultimately to be structured and transformed on the symbolic plane. The ego ideal is established by introjecting the signifier that is a representative of the law and acts as the big other within ourselves. The ego ideal functions as a kind of internalized compass that guides experiences and relationships, allowing desire to shift and making sublimation possible by raising the object to the dignity of the signifier. 
Also important to note is that the ego idea plays a critical role in the process of sexuation and will be a determining factor as to whether the subject assumes a more masculine or feminine subjective structure, regardless of the subject's biological sex. Unlike the superego, the ego ideal is a symbolic identification that often appears as what we might say as egocentric, wherein I assume its message as my own and wherein its demands seemingly move me toward ends that are productive, that I aspire to and agree with, whereas the superego is more often encountered as a hostile foreignness that is more prohibitive rather than productive. Hence, the superego is an instrument of repression, whereas the ego ideal encourages sublimation. The articulation of need as demand first gets formulated in passing through the locus of signifiers located at the place of the big other, which then gets quilted to a particular meaning. The message then reappears as a reformulated demand passed on to the ego ideal. If the ego ideal is identified with, the demand is then assumed as my own. I mentioned the demand to write a book last time and quickly questioned whether it was truly me who was making the demand of myself. And that's because this demand I make of myself, which I claim in some sense is my own, is a demand that does not originate from me and continues to have in sometimes subtle and not so subtle ways an independence from me, though not one as severe as the superego. Consequently, this demand to write a book would call my attention and induce feelings of guilt whenever I stopped working on it. It dictated how I went about my other tasks, how much time I spent on them, etc. So we can observe that my demands, whether they are of myself or others, stem from this internalization of the law through the ego ideal. The message itself is a point of satisfaction and disappointment. It delivers satisfaction by providing speech with a meaning. As such, there is a degree of recognition that comes with this. But at the same time, it's only a partial satisfaction because there's always a refusal embedded in the message, one born of the fundamental prohibition that puts up limits to one's enjoyment. Now, where do the prohibited signifiers go? What happens to that element of demand not satisfied? Addressing these questions requires us to move to a third graph. To begin, we'll focus on this horizontal line that may be referred to as the line of castration, though I don't think Lacan names it that here. It parallels the line of prohibition below, and the line displays the terms jouissance and castration at its ends. Considering the voice is what supports the signifier to give rise to speech, we can infer perhaps that castration is the vehicle by which one can attain some form of indirect enjoyment. The commencement of the horizontal line where the notion of jouissance comes to light denotes, I think, another mythological state of unity and completeness that has been forfeited and can only be retrospectively reminisced. It's plausible to consider the placement of that delta symbol from the initial diagram at this particular juncture. The term castration herein denotes the relinquishment of the fanciful object that was meant to bestow a boundless jouissance, and furthermore serves as a representation of the perpetual insufficiency that the individual is henceforth compelled to accept. Lacanian psychoanalysis centers around a coming to terms with this castration, which is not a literal act applied to select individuals, but an enduring feeling of incompleteness, unfulfillment, and discontent that permeates our existence. And we'll spend much of that existence attempting to manage, conceal, contradict, or compensate for it. The formulation of demand and the prohibition that regulates its message produces a remainder that is named desire, as we've talked about last time. This desire is rooted in the gap that exists between the tangible fulfillment of needs and the demand for unconditional love. Notably, the big other is intimately intertwined with desire in this context. In cutting through the location of the other, the line of prohibition also makes a privation in the other. 
revealing a desire beyond all concrete demands. The nature of this desire is fundamentally enigmatic as it pertains not only to the subject's desire, but also to the others. As demonstrated here on the graph, the subject's desire is only reached by first passing through the other, highlighting then an intimate and intrinsic connection between the two. And so desire presents with an ambiguous and ambivalent character encapsulated by the central notion that desire is the desire of the other. This phrase can be apprehended in no less than four closely interrelated ways. Firstly, the desire of the subject is a desire for the other with an aspiration to possess the other in their distinct otherness. This is the sense in which we might think of love as to love what in the other the other lacks. Secondly, the subject desires to become the object of the other's desire, craving their recognition in love. Thirdly, the subject desires to have what the other desires, thereby finding an object that will sustain desire, which initially takes shape as an imaginary object before being raised to the level of a symbolic object post-castration. Lastly, the subject's desire is the desire of the other, so one's desire is never pure and original to the subject. But instead, as Lacan indicates, and as I quoted last time, one's desire has always already slept with other signifiers. This concept of desire implies a certain degree of dependence on and subjection to the other in relation to one's own desire. As a result, a pivotal question emerges for the subject, which is not explicitly depicted in seminar five as its own graph, but will be later on. It's the question, what is it that you desire? This inquiry can take on various forms, such as what does the other want? What does the other want from me? What does the other want that I don't have, etc. As a caveat, it's important to acknowledge that the four distinct interpretations of desire as the desire of the other are each present in a given subject, but in varying manners. The unique manner by which desire is constituted in these ways will, in a sense, preserve something for the subject that simply cannot be captured by the other's desire. The desiring subject is not merely assimilated into the other's desire, but rather maintains a distinct singularity in which their desire is uniquely constituted vis-a-vis -vis the big other and not simply a copy and paste of the other's desire. And this will be evidenced, for example, by the role of fantasy in its relationship to desire, which we'll turn to next. One's desire eludes complete subjugation to the symbolic, as I've said, and instead becomes linked to fantasy. This residual aspect of desire cannot be fully assimilated into the relationship with the other, representing a vestige of a mythological jouissance that now gets concentrated in a highly particular form. You can see how the connection between desire and fantasy parallels the imaginary relation on the bottom half of the graph. Indeed, the symbol here includes the little a, suggesting an imaginary component to fantasy, but now in relation to the split subject. As Lacan states, fantasy is essentially an imaginary embedded in a particular signifying function. However, this little a cannot be equated with the imaginary object that the subject had originally attempted to identify with and become. It lacks this kind of imaginary wholeness and it instead is a part object, one detached from its original context. Such an object has some basis in the body but now with a transformed significance in light of being taken up by the signifier. This becomes most glaringly apparent in the case of a fetish, but there is a fetishistic element to every fantasy, even though it need not entail a perverse subjective structure. The relationship between the partial object of fantasy and the split subject indicates that fantasy can only be approached while always maintaining a certain distance. Rather than serving as the source of satisfaction of desire, it sustains and supports desire in its very desiring, leading to a kind of wandering pursuit for this unattainable ideal. Another key difference between fantasy and the imaginary object is that fantasy is structured by signifiers in such a manner that stabilizes it. For this reason, fantasy is stubbornly embedded within us, unlike the purely imaginary object, which is always in flux. 
Despite fantasy marking a distinct mode of jouissance and serving as a particular manner by which desire is sustained for a subject, this fantasy is only sustained insofar as the other is recognized as a lacking subject. Fantasy is a particular response to the question, what does the other want? It's a manner of responding to the enigmatic desire of the other by providing an answer that also serves as a defense against castration, and it fashions a mask that veils this lack of the other for which it was a response. Lacan will also identify this mask with the symptom, and I think that is not entirely surprising when you see that the line leading from fantasy heads directly to the message wherein the symptom is also located. As such, the symptom may be thought of as a kind of enigmatic metaphorical message that originates from the unconscious fantasy that itself marks a particular position of the subject in relation to the big other. In our upcoming exploration of hysterical and obsessional neuroses, we'll discover how this unique process plays out. This point of intersection denotes the signifier for the lack of the other, coinciding with the placement of the symbolic phallus. So what are these and why are they tied together here? We have already indicated that the lack of the other coincides with the other's desire. But I think we can also say that it refers to an element that resists the structuring of the symbolic, giving rise to a gap within symbolic reality itself. The symbolic phallus, in essence, I think is a representation of the inherent deficiency within the other, emphasizing the fundamental incompleteness that shall forever remain. It's not an indication of some previous presence that has now vanished, nor is it referring to the potential for some sort of future retrieval of something. Rather, it symbolizes the concept of absence itself, signifying an everlasting vacancy that can never be filled. Lacan also calls the symbolic phallus the signifier that represents the signifier's relation to the signified. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means that every particular attempt at seeking out a meaning for one's desire, every desired object, will forever be marked with this incompleteness. So in a sense, the symbolic phallus marks every so-called imaginary phallus as a failure. And this is why the signifier is distinct from all other signifiers. It is a signifier marking the limit of the symbolic itself, and thus it is what is fundamentally unthinkable. And so recognizing the symbolic phallus thus entails recognizing a hole in the symbolic itself, and more specifically, recognizing that a lack marks the big other, and thus is a point in which one can recognize not simply one's own desire, but to get to know one's desire through the desire that is in, of, and from the other. To recognize this location, then, it seems, entails a recognition of one's castration as well, which is a critical feature for coming to terms with that tragic dimension of the human condition. But because it is so threatening, it's not for nothing that desire constantly seeks it out through its fantasy, and, as we'll soon see, the drive bypasses it by aiming directly at the fantasy itself. Turning to this next intersecting point wherein we find the barred subject in relation to capital D, which stands for demand. If the barred subject's relation to fantasy marks the place where the subject cannot be for the fantasy to remain, the presence of the barred subject where demand is found seems to suggest a demand that the subject cannot be fully present to either. This is a bit confusing. Why is demand here when we already discussed the formulation of demand below? To begin, let's recall that demand is where a need is formulated by signifiers. There's a remainder from this that gets name desire. We can then see here that from this desire arises this other demand. But a demand that emanates from desire and is detached from the concrete discourse of the subject. Here I want to suggest that what we have is a pure demand of the other, a demand that takes on a life of its own independent from the wider signifying chain wherein desire moves. As Lacan states, drive is the technical term we give to this desire insofar as speech isolates it, fragments it, and places it in this problematic and disjointed relationship to its aim. 
This is what Lacan calls the drive, a label I don't think he makes explicit in Seminar 5 with this area, even though uh, he speaks about the drive at various points in the seminar. But I'm going to make another suggestion here, and as far as I can tell, this is my own sort of interpretation and one I made in particular in an essay I wrote on the foreign body, which I, in that essay, opposed to the lived body of phenomenology. There seems to me an intimate link between the drive and the superego. And in light of what I've already said about the paternal superego, I believe that this place marks the location of the maternal superego. Now, why do I say this? First, there's several places throughout Freud's text wherein he connects superego and the drive, which I point to in that essay I mentioned. Second, the claim seems to be supported by what Lacan says in Seminar 5 when speaking of the obsessional's symptoms as the demands of the superego, adding that this occurs at the level of this formula here. The way Lacan describes the maternal superego in this manner converges well with the character of the drive, such as where Lacan states that the maternal superego compared to the paternal superego is much more demanding, more oppressive, more devastating, and more insistent. Third, in doing a little research and writing the script, I came across Adrian Johnston's work, Time Driven, where he makes some of these connections as well, such as where he writes, like the death drive, qua drive source, the superego operates beyond the pleasure principle. Both the drives and the superego are uncompromising matters within the organization of the psyche. However, he doesn't say they're exactly the same right here. And we do still have to consider that this pure demand, which identified with the maternal superego, is not alone, but is put in relation to the barred subject. And let us recall that the barred subject refers to the impossibility of the subject to be fully present to itself, that this split occurs through the intervention of the signifier, and that this split marks some unknowable it that speaks through me, hence why it is also identified with the id. If this is correct, then what we have here represented can be also talked about in terms of the superego's relationship with the id, wherein desire gets radically subverted and perverted, transformed into a kind of hyper-focused, repetitive insistence that here is being named the drive. At this point, we can rightfully ask, how do desire and the drive coexist and relate to one another in an ongoing manner? And how does each relate to fantasy? Desire is a ceaseless movement whose conscious dimension is typically experienced as disappointment. It is fundamentally nomadic, having nowhere it can permanently settle. In this sense, it obeys the symbolic law that through the paternal superego and ego ideal, both prohibits an original and mythological source of enjoyment and demands the subject to go out and find its own symbolically sanctioned substitutes. Fantasy, which entails a symbolic transformation of this original enjoyment and which is kept at a safe distance, sustains desire and propels it forward to seek it out elsewhere in other objects. With this understanding, desire, as my own lack, can be understood as always aiming at what the other lacks, and that this movement is, in a certain sense, strongly dictated by the law of the symbolic order. But here is where drive comes into play. Drive sabotages the movement of desire by aiming at the object of fantasy itself. It seeks out the real source of enjoyment, even as it's only aiming at a mask and circles around it in a compulsive manner. But I argue that drive is still obeying a command, this time of the maternal superego, which demands to enjoy in contrast to the paternal superego that prohibits enjoyment. So we have a very interesting situation here, I think, wherein we find a fundamental contradiction, not merely in the subject, but within the very symbolic itself, which seemingly has within itself the seeds of its own subversion, being played out here between mom and dad or between society and its exception. This reminded me of Bakhtin's analysis of Carnival, better known as Mardi Gras. He describes Carnival as a form of social and cultural expression that subverts traditional power structures 
and allows for the expression of alternative perspectives. The carnival is a temporary, often festive event that involves the inversion of social hierarchies and the suspension of rules and norms. During the carnival, people from all walks of life come together to engage in collective acts of celebration, play, and humor. Through these acts, they challenge the dominant cultural and political structures that govern their lives. For Bakhtin, the carnival provides a space for social critique and resistance. But important to add here, I think, is that carnival is a ritualistic activity that precedes the beginning of Lent, wherein the faithful are expected to make sacrifices in anticipation of Resurrection Sunday, that being Easter. And so I think there remains a complicity through this conflict. Hence why Lent and Carnival complement each other within the larger society. Without Lent, there would be little reason to engage in such orgiastic debauchery. But without the orgiastic debauchery, Lent would perhaps present too great of a burden to adhere to. Bringing this back to drive and desire now, it seems that the tension between drive and desire is one internal to the symbolic itself but that this tension is born out of the fact that the big other is lacking, that there is a fundamental unknowability that resists symbolization. Desire and drive, then, are two distinct strategies for dealing with this. And so we might be able to say that in the midst of their conflict, that there is a kind of secret collusion that is at play here, with desire being born out of prohibition and demand and drive being born out of a demand to rebel against prohibition. Each has been linked to a particular expression of the superego with the paternal superego serving as the voice of a repressive agency and the maternal superego serving as the voice of rebellion against this. In this sense, Lacan can claim in seminar one that, quote, the superego is at one and the same time the law and its destruction. I think this has notable implications for our acts, as it suggests our acts of rebellion against authority, for instance, are very likely often in the service of that authority. And we can see how this tension is played out politically in those groups that are more on the side of desire and those that are more on the side of drive, but in fact are both in service of the same master. And so what recourse is left to us in light of this? if I'm at all on the right path in my description of this situation. Herein is where I would agree with those who say that the first step is to recognize the situation, which entails coming to terms with one's own castration and thus recognizing how one is always already implicated in whatever so-called evils they identify out there. To recognize that I am also an expression of the contradiction seen in the wider society in which I am situated. Thus, the truly radical act, whatever it might be, cannot be purely the transgressive enjoyment of the drives, nor the sublimated enjoyments of desire. But this still leaves us at an impasse. One, I would resist wanting to resolve with facile answers. And so we'll have to punctuate this discussion by ending it now. If you found this video helpful and is within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below this video. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is below. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. Well, I went off uh, a little bit on that uh, video, but next time we're gonna get into all the clinical structures and how they might fit within this graph of desire. And so, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.